of the direction of the treatment and the principles of its power. Part 7. Report to the Kulak de Royaumont, 10th to the 13th of July, 1958. 1. Who analyzes today? It has become a commonplace to say that an analysis is marked by the person or the analysant. But if anyone interests himself in the effects that the person of the analyst may have on the an may have on the analysis, he is thought to be very bold man indeed. This, at least, would explain the slight tremor we f we feel when modish remarks are made about the counter-transference. Remarks that serve simply to mask its conceptual inadequacy. What nobility of soul we display when we reveal that we ourselves are made of the same clay as those we mold. Now that's a naughty thing to say, but it's hardly enough for those at whom it is aimed. When people now go about proclaiming under the banner of psychoanalysis that they are striving for an emotional re-education of the patient? Situating the action of the analyst at this level sweeps away a position of principle. With regard to which anything that might be said about the counter-transference, however valid it may be in itself, is merely a diversion for the imposture that I wish to dislodge here now lies beyond such considerations. What I am denouncing, however, is not those elements in present-day psychoanalysis that might be termed anti-Freudian, for in that we should be grateful to them for lowering their mask, since they pride themselves on going beyond what, in fact, they are ignorant of. Having retained from Freud's teaching just enough to feel to what extent what they have said about their experience is not consonant with that teaching. I hope to show I hope to show how the inability to sustain a praxis in an authentic manner results, as is usually the case with mankind, in the exercise of power. <clears throat> Certainly, the psychoanalyst directs the treatment. The first principle of this, of this treatment, the one that is spelt out to him before all else, and which he and which he meets and which he meets throughout his training to the extent that he becomes utterly imbued with it is that he must not direct the patient the direction of conscience in the sense of the moral guidance that a catholic might might find in it is radically excluded here If psychoanalysis poses problems for moral theology, they are not those of the direction of conscience, speaking of which I would add that the direction of conscience itself poses problems. The distinction with the union types who think that they're always conscious, conscious or <sighs> The direction of the treatment is something quite different. First of all, it consists in making the subject apply the analytic rule. That is, the directives whose presence cannot be ignored in the principle of what is called the analytic situation, on the pretext that the, subjects, uh, that the subject would apply would apply them perfectly well without thinking about it. 
These directives are initially presented to the patient in the form of instructions which, however little actual comment the analyst makes on them, will reveal through the way in which they are presented the analyst's own understanding of them. Which does not mean that the analyst is any the less involved in the mass of prejudices which, depending on the notion that cultural diffusion has allowed him to form of the methods and aim of the psychoanalytic enterprise. Bilagi, Bilagi, the patient at this stage. This is already enough to show us that from the initial directives on the problem of direction cannot be formulated in, a, in an univocal communication, a fact that forces us to pause at this stage and to throw further light on it in what follows. Let us simply state that reducing it to its bare truth This stage consists in making the patient forget that it is merely a question of words spoken. But that this does not excuse the analyst for forgetting it himself. Moreover, I have declared that it is from the angle of the analyst that I intend to approach my subject. Let us say that in the pooling of resources involved in a common enterprise, the patient is not the only one who finds it difficult to pay his share. The analyst, too, must pay. Pay with words, no doubt. If the transmutation that they undergo from the analytic operation raises them to the level of interpretation, but also pay with his person, in that whatever happens, he lends it as a support for the singular phenomena that analysis has discovered in the transference. Can anyone forget that in order to intervene in an action that goes on, the heart of being, gern und Cyrus, Weisens, as Freud put it, he must pay with that which is essential in his most intimate judgment. Could he remain alone outside the field of play? Let those who support our cause not be concerned at the thought that I am offering myself here once again to opponents who are always only too happy to send me back to my, to my metaphysics, for it is only on the basis of their claim to be satisfied with practical efficacy that a statement like the analyst cures not so much by what he says and does than by, by what he is. Can be made. Nobody apparently demands an explanation for much for such a statement, any more than one appeals to their author's sense of modesty when, with a tired smile directed at the derision that he incurs, he falls back on goodness. His goodness. We must be good. No transcendence in the context. To put an end to the end, to the endless argument about the transferent neurosis. But who would be cruel enough to question someone bent double under the weight of his luggage when his bearing already indicates that it is full of bricks? Yet being is being. 
whoever invokes it, and we have a right to ask what it is doing here. So I shall cross-examine the, the analyst again, insofar as I am myself one, and observe that the less sure he is of his action, the more interested he is in his being. As an interpreter of what is presented to me in words or deeds, I am my own miracle, and articulate it as I please, sole master of my ship after God. You're delighted. And, of course, far from being able to measure the whole effect of my words, but well aware of the fact and striving to guard against it. In other words, always free in, in the timing, frequency, and choice of my interventions to the point that it seems that the rule has been arranged entirely so as not to impede in any way my own freedom of movement, that to which the material aspect is correlative and under which my action here takes what it produces. Because it's his being that shows that he can make the transference. So in saying that there's a certain thing that can be done, the, the an Elizand is going to doubt it unless he goes out and does it himself. And then the next session, the transference will be automatically set up to work. He might be trying to give a false impression, but it's possible too. Though the way I saw it is that he would always push them back unless it was something that was like necessary. You know, like someone who's been so alone and who hasn't had sex for in forever, and it's like either that and he does it, or he rejects them and they go back and shoot themselves that kind of exception but even that it wasn't ever crystallized on a specific contextual order I mean he he does put people in doubt at some point I think it was seminar 18 there was fuck all there was nobody because he totally changed his ideas and he was saying that like yeah he was just doing it to to work through the, the the extremes of the psyche, or take like Jifrik, par exemple, he travaille avec les psychotiques, et les psychotiques ont aucun désir de, de travailler leur fétiche plus loin, c'est l'amour. There is no meta language, means that there's no point trying elsewhere if it's not working in front of you. because otherwise it would be working elsewhere. In my handling of the transference, on the other hand, my action here takes, yeah, yeah on the other hand, my freedom is alienated by the duplication to which my person is subjected in it. And everyone knows that it is there that the secret of, an, of analysis is to be sought. Well, yeah, outside of it, by the foundations of the, the pairs of relationships that you see happen within it. This does not prevent people believing that they are really getting somewhere where they discover the learned notion that psychoanalysis must be studied as a situation involving two people, two persons. It is no doubt hedged about conditions that restrain its movements. But the situation 
thus conceived serves nevertheless to articulate and without more artifice than the emotional re-education referred to above <laughs> the principles of a training of the weak ego <laughs> by an ego that one pleases to believe is capable on account of and even if it does it's only by making peace with that concept that it's ever going to get anywhere on account of its strength of carrying out such a project but the thing with psychotics is that they're they're trapped in this idea where they think that they're they're, they're being persecuted so they they almost think that the only love that they have from the other person in the world is set up for that and they're kind of not that wrong <laughs> But that's not the point anyways. So what might it be? Um, without a certain... That... Such a view is not expressed without a certain embarrassment is shown by the strikingly clumsy regrets that are offered. Like, the one that specifies that there must be no compromise on the need for a cure from within. But it is also the more significant to observe that the ascent of the subject referred to in this passage comes only secondarily after an effect that was first of all imposed. It gives me no pleasure to point out these deviations. My aim is rather that these Reefs should serve as beacons on our route. In fact, every analyst, even if he is one of those who wander off course in this way, always experiences the transference and wonder at the least expected fact of a relationship between two people that seems like any other. He tells himself that he has to make his peace with a phenomenon for which he is not responsible. And we know with what insistence Freud stressed, stressed the spontaneity of the patient's transference. For some time now, analysts in the heart-rending revisions that they treat us to have been ready enough to insinuate that this insistence of which they were for so long the bulwark <clears throat> expresses in Freud a light from the commitment that the notion of situation presupposes. We are, you see, up to date. But it is rather the facile exaltation of their gesture and throwing feelings which they class under the heading of their counter-transference. In, uh, in one side of the scales, thus balancing the transference itself with their own weight, which for me is evidence of an unhappy con consciousness correlative with the failure to conceive the true nature of the transference. One cannot regard the fantasies that the analyst imposes on the person of the analyst in the same way as a perfect card player might strategy uh, might might guess his opponent's intentions. No doubt there is always an element of strategy. But one should not be deceived by the metaphor of the mirror. Appropriate as it may be to the smooth surface that the analyst presents to the patient, an impassive face and sealed lips do not have the same purpose here as in a game of bridge. Here, the analyst is rather bring, 
bringing bringing to his aid what in bridge is called the dummy, le mort. But he is doing so in order to introduce the fourth player. Who is to be the who is who is to be the partner of the analysand here? And whose hand the analyst by his tactics will try to expose such as the link let us save the abnegation that is imposed on the analyst by the stake of the game in the analysis one might pursue the metaphor by deducing his game according to whether he places himself on the right or the left la droite infinie uh, or the left of the patient that is to say in a position to play after bef or before the fourth player to play that is to say before or after the player with the dummy. But what is certain is that the analyst's feelings have only one possible game, only one possible place in the game, that of the dummy, and that if he is reanimated, the game will proceed without anyone knowing who is leading. That is why the analyst is less free in his strategy than in his tactics. Let us take this further. The analyst is even less free as to, as to that which dominates strategy and tactics, namely his policy, double underline, where he would be better advised to take his bearings from his want to be, manque à être, rather than from his being. To put it another way, his action on the patient escapes him through the idea that he forms of it as long as he does not grasp its starting point, in that by which it is, it is possible, as long as he does not retain the paradox of its foresightedness. In order to revise in principle the structure by which any action intervenes in reality, for today's psychoanalysts, this relation to reality goes without saying. They measure the patient's defections from that relation on the authoritarian principle that is always employed by educators. Furthermore, they rely on the teaching analysis to ensure its maintenance at a sufficient rate among analysts. <clears throat> Who are not allowed to feel that in confronting the human problems that are presented to them, their views will sometimes be somewhat parochial. This is merely to remove the problem from an individual level, and it is hardly reassuring when they trace the procedure of analysis as the reduction in the subject of deviations attributed to his transference and his resistances, <coughs> but mapped in reality to reality to hear them declaiming about the perfect perfectly simple situation that is provided by analysis as a means of measuring up to reality come now the educator is not ready to be educated if he can take so lightly an experience that he too must have undergone. One would have expected from such an appreciation that these analysts would have given other twists to this experience if they had to depend on their sense of reality to invent it themselves. A priority too, too shameful to be, a priority too shameful to be thought of.
Okay. of the measure of the real. <coughs> this num this turns out to be the autonomous ego. This is the supposedly organized ensemble of the most disparate functions that lend their support to the subject's feelings of innateness. It is regarded as the person non conflictual Oh, fuck. It is regarded as the autonomous <clears throat> because it appears to be sheltered from the conflicts of the person's non-conflictual sphere. One recognizes there a down-at-heel mirage that had already been rejected as untenable by the most academic psychology of, an, of introspection. Yet this regression is celebrated as a return to the fold of general psychology. However, it does solve the problem of the analysts being a team of egos, no doubtless equal than autonomous. But by what trade do they recognize in one another the sufficiency of their autonomy? is offered to the Americans to guide them towards happiness without upsetting the autonomies, <laughs> egoistical or otherwise, that pave with their non-conflictual spheres the American way of getting there. To sum up, if the analyst were dealing only with resistances, he would look twice before hazarding an interpretation, as is in the as is in fact the case, but in doing so he would have done all that could be expected of him. However, this interpretation, if he gives it, will be received as coming from the person that the transference imputes him to be. Will he agree to benefit from this error concerning the person? The ethics of analysis do not contradict this, on condition that the analyst interprets this effect. Otherwise, the analysis will amount to little more than a crude suggestion. An incontestable position, except that the analyst's words will still be heard as coming from the other of the transference. The emergence of the subject from the transference is thus postponed ad infinitum. It is therefore because the subject imputes being, being that is elsewhere to the analyst that an interpretation can return to the place from which it may bear on the distribution of responses. But <clears throat> who will say <clears throat> but who will say what the analyst is and what remains of him <clears throat> of him? when it comes to the task of interpreting. Let him dare to say it himself if all he has to say to us by way of an answer is that he is a man. Whether or not he has anything to say would then be all there is to it. Yet it is there that he beats a retreat not only on account of the impudence of the mystery, but because in this having, it is being that is question. And how? We, will, we shall see later that this how is not, an easy, is not an easy matter. Moreover, he prefers to fall back on his ego, and on the bit of reality he knows. But then 
He is on terms of I and me, Azure et à moi, with his patient. How can he manage if there are daggers drawn? It is here. It is here. One is astute in counting on the intelligences that must be in the place named for the purpose of the occasion. The healthy part of the ego. The part thinks as we do. QED. One might conclude. Which brings us back to our initial problem. Namely, how to reinvent analysis. Or to recast it. By treating the transference as a particular form of resistance. Many profess to do just this. It is to them that I would pose the question that forms the title of this chapter. Who is the analyst? He who interprets profiting from the transference. He who analyzes it at he who analyzes it as resistance. Or he who imposes his idea of reality? It is a question that may get a tighter grip on those to whom it is addressed, and be less easy to avoid than a question who is speaking. The impatient answer, an animal of our species, while it would be more annoyingly tautological to respond dutifully to the changed question with me, as bluntly as that, let's go back.